You know, language is an interesting thing. <clears throat> in most languages, we have masculine words and feminine words, but in English, we have masculine words, feminine words, then like neutral words. Matter of fact, most of ours are non-gendered terms. Like boat, house, car, all those kind of things. They, they, they're just, we call them an it uh, kind of deal. But in most languages, it's not like that. And the Bible is written in two languages, Hebrew and Greek, a little bit of Aramaic and other stuff, but mostly Hebrew and Greek. And those are both, everything is either masculine or feminine. So that creates some interesting situations. Like for example, there's no word for humanity really in the Bible. There's no word for human beings. The Bible will use the word man. Now there are words for male and female that are very distinct. And there are no other terms, there's just those two, male and female. We don't want to have 52, or there's just two, male and female. For example, Ish and Ishad. That's just what you learn in your seventh grade biology class. That's just the difference between male and female. There are also some other words. Zakara Nikvah. Zakara means to remember because it's by a man. His name is remembered. They were the son of this person. It's by the last name. The man's name is passed down. Nikvah, the word for female, means hollow spot because a woman had to have a hollow spot because she could carry a baby. So just very picture oriented. And so you get those words. But then you get some words that just mean what we would think of as human beings. Uh, and so the Bible uses the word man, but <clears throat> probably mankind is a better way to understand that. And we run into one of those in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. So we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 11. He says, but as for you, O man of God, the, the, the New Testament is written in Greek and that word actual for man's word, anthropology, which is the study of human beings and the bones that they have left and other such stuff. And so here the idea, this is a word that typically is not used for males, it's used for what we would think of as mankind, the way I would, but anyway. Um, so as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Let me start here. I love it when a preacher amens himself. Apostle Paul does so. So in the first half of verse 11, it says, if we're going to be, if you want to be a person of God, a man of God, then you need to flee these things. Now, what are these things? It's, it's a bunch of the stuff that he listed in the first 10 verses, uh, wrong teaching, wrong attitudes, wrong behaviors, wrong priorities. And we kind of sum it all up with sins. But he says that you are to flee these things. Now, there are two ways that you can do something typically. One way is once. You do it and it's done. It's over. Like I got married. Marriage brings us together. Okay, some of you need to watch The Princess Bride because you're culturally deprived otherwise. Love, true love. Dear we be what? Have y'all not seen that? That's the most quoted movie of all time. Um, at least that's what they say. So, and who is they? I don't know, but somewhere I read it, it's the most quoted movie. Anyway, so you get married, that's, you do it, and that's it. But there are other things that you do regularly, like eat. I can look at you, you eat. It's a habit. You, you sleep. You breathe. It's a, so when it says flee, unfortunately, he's speaking about a habit. It'd be great if it was a one-off deal. You flee sin and it never bothers you again. I would love it if I could have victory over sin one day and then I don't have to ever worry about it the rest of my life. But it's not like that. Sin and temptation are consistent, and so fleeing has to be consistent. So he, he, the word flee here carries the idea of, of consistently, habitually, regularly fleeing sin because it's dangerous for us. 
She says, oh man of God, I want you to regularly do this. It was April 26th of 1986. Reactor number four at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant had a power surge which led to a meltdown and one of the worst nuclear disasters in the history of uh, humanity. Over 350,000 people had to evacuate the city and leave. Not to return. As a matter of fact, Chernobyl is still so dangerous that people don't go there. They avoid it. They stay away. Well, why do they stay away from it? Because it's dangerous. You and I need to recognize that sin is dangerous and we need to flee from it. And when we flee, we don't go back. Hello? I understand the flee and go back thing. We lived for 10 years in South Louisiana. Hurricane's coming. You leave for a few days. Hurricane comes through. You go back, clamp the mess, and wait for the next one. You leave and you return. Fleeing isn't that. We don't flee and return. We don't go and come back. He said we need to, to get away and to stay away from sin and temptation. Now that's all fine and good. But the reality is if all you're doing is fleeing, you're going to be in trouble. Because if you spend your life fleeing, looking at what you're trying to stay away from and get away from, you're going to crash. You can't always be looking at what you're leaving. You're going to run into a tree, a telephone pole or something. Now, I don't know how else to, maybe, here's the easy way to grasp what I'm saying. If you're not really clear what I mean by, don't look at what you're fleeing. I want you to go to some place with lots of people today, like the supermarket, and I just want you to walk backwards. I'm staying away from aisle number six. It won't be long, you're going to run into somebody or something. So if all of our life is spent figuring out what we need to flee, we're going to be miserable and unhappy. And the reality is, there's a lot of preaching that is all the stuff you need to flee. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of Sundays that from a lot of pulpits, unfortunately, the whole sermon is on what you ought to stay away from. And point number two is, I've stayed away from it, so obviously I'm godly. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Our faith is not built on what we flee. So in the second half of verse 11, he says, are there things we need to stay away from, but there are also things we need to follow, things we need to pursue. So look what he says, pursue, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. The idea of pursuing is to run after it, chase it down. So for those of you who who are not struggling, there are six of these. So let's talk about what they are. What in the world is righteousness? Righteousness is a moral standard. It means to be straight, to morally straight. But that raises the question, who decides what's morally right? Who decides what's morally straight? Well, I can assure you, it's not you. I always love when people say, well, you know what I think. I'm like, well, thank you for what you think. But what you think is not the standard for my life. It's not you. It's not your parents. It's not your friends. It's not the church. God decides. God has revealed in his Bible what is right. And God sets the moral standard. And so if you and I are going to be righteous, then we, our lives need to conform to the standard that God has laid down in his word. The, the straightness. So pursue moral straightness, righteousness. And then godliness. What in the world is godliness? It's fellowship with God. You know, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that I like, and some of it I don't like, but I have to do it anyway because it's in the Bible. Don't look at me all pious. If you had your choice, you'd just like, you'd, you'd I'm like, I'm not eating beets. Kind of, you know, but it's all in there. There's some things that, you know, but, but one of the cool things in the Bible is it starts off with God makes Adam and Eve and he doesn't say, okay, I'll come back and check on you. The Bible says that he walked with them in the garden. God desires to be with us and for us to be with him. God doesn't want to be distant from his people. And so godliness is walking in fellowship with God. Read the Bible, pray, fasting, all those things that you and I want to have fellowship with God. I mean, think about it. We're going to spend forever with him. Forever with him. As a matter of fact, if you ever wonder why the Bible presents God as him and father when God's really not male, he's spirit. You all understand that, right? I quote you the verse in John chapter four. God is spirit. Those words mean worship him spirit and truth. So why does God do that? Because God doesn't want to reveal himself as a donkey or a lion or anything else. God reveals himself as a person because he wants to have a personal relationship with us. We don't worship a block of stone. We worship the living God. 
whom we can have fellowship with. So that's godliness, we want to have fellowship with him. And then faith. I find this one fascinating. Chase after faith. What is faith? Faith is trusting God to do what he said he's going to do. Trusting God with your life. Trusting God with your future and your family. Now, the fact that he says pursue faith indicates that many people struggle with trusting God. And for those of you, let me rephrase that, for those of us who are control freaks and like to be in charge, this is difficult. And some of you are looking at your spouse saying, right now saying, he is talking to you. We need to, to pursue letting God be in control, not us. And then love. We need to pursue love, loving other people. We need to per pursue ministering to other people. If you want to find a life of purpose and meaning, find it in loving and ministering and serving other people. And you'll find the real joy of the Christian life. It's not about what you flee, it's about what you follow. And then steadfastness, all oh, steadfastness, sometimes translated as patience or endurance. The idea is to stay under it. You know, when the going gets tough, the tough don't run off. And the reason that you and I are supposed to pursue this is because life, we'll find some great blessings in it when we stay with it, when we stick with it, when we endure. Right, let's, let's just talk about this. There are Sundays you don't feel like coming to church. So, well, how do you know that? Because first of all, there are Sundays I don't feel like coming to church. Now, I have to because everybody's got to go to work. <laughs> But I mean, there's some Sunday, you just don't, you know, and, and some of you, some of you, you're not really excited about being here. You go, well, how do you know that? Because you come in late. I mean, man, if this was like, you just couldn't wait to be here, you'd be here early. I get it. I get it. Sometimes, but you know what? We come anyway. We endure. We stay with it. Matter of fact, what I've discovered is some of the best Sundays I've had are the ones that I didn't want to show up. Because it's kind of God's way of reminding me how good he is. And then we're not here because I feel like being here or something like that. We're here and we're reminded how good God is and how great it is to worship Jesus and how great it is to hang out with other believers worshiping Jesus. And so on some of the Sundays when you don't feel like being here, but you're steadfast, you come anyway, you'll receive an incredible blessing. Now let's get a little deeper in that. You know, some days it's hard being married. Don't say amen. I do not want to get you. Don't. Just don't, 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 this is one of those places, don't, just look straight forward. Just look back. Some days it's tough being married. There's some days you're thinking, if we have to have this discussion about where the dirty clothes go one more time, somebody's about to get hurt up in here. And you're thinking, you know, and, and but you know what? Steadfastness says, I stick with it. I stay with it. Marriage is tough, but when you're steadfast and you stay with it, you discover it's a far greater blessing than the challenges that you run into. You don't bolt when it gets tough. You stay with it. You're steadfast. And you discover, he said, we need to pursue steadfastness. And now let's take one more step. It is not always easy being a parent. It's not easy. In fact, some days it's tough. Some days you're thinking, I'm a man. And the word poopy is in my vocabulary. <laughs> I mean, some days it's tough. You know what? You don't put the kids out on the curb with a sign that says, free, you can take it. <laughs> like, you are steadfast. You stay with it. Because even though it's difficult and even though it's tough sometimes, the blessing is far greater than the challenges. And so the Bible says that when it comes to serving God, there are going to be days you don't feel like it. There are going to be times it's going to be difficult. There are times it's going to be a challenge. Stay with it. I guarantee you it will be a blessing in your life if you do so. As a matter of fact, the real challenge for the Christian life is not how you start, it's how you finish. And steadfastness about finishing and knowing that it was worth all that we did. And then there's gentleness. Now what is gentleness? Gentleness is not weakness. Gentleness is is knowing that you can, but not. Gentleness is just what it sounds like, being gentle with others, even when you could be far more forceful. Man, your wife wants you to be gentle with her. She doesn't want you to be a wimp. 
She wants you to be masculine. But part of masculinity is also knowing when to be gentle. Because I'm a visual learner, anytime I see stuff like this, I try to picture in my mind like what it looks like. And every time I read the word gentle in the Bible, I always picture some big giant dude holding a little baby. You know, he could snap the baby's neck. He could destroy that child. Even though he has the ability to do so, he does not. Because gentleness is self-control. And it's like a strong man gently holding a baby. And you and I need to learn how to be gentle with people. Just because we can doesn't mean that we should. And so he says that we need to pursue gentleness. Now, these both run together, the fleeing and the following. And here's why. Some people think, well, I'll follow God, but there's some sins I want to take with me. I'll pursue righteousness and godliness and steadfastness, faith and love and, 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 and gentleness. I'll do that. I'll do that. But, but I, I, I don't really want to kind of leave some of those sins behind. I kind of want to take some of them with me. Well, this is what that's like. It's like trying to run a race wearing a heavy backpack. I mean, you can do it, but you're gonna hurt yourself. You're gonna wear out. He says, drop the backpack. Okay, all right, let's time it. I know some of you are thinking, it's a prop. There's nothing in there. All right, let's just, I just wanna get verification. Here you go, Alan. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, there's, yeah, it's a sledgehammer and some other stuff. So when you flee, okay, I didn't test this before this morning. I was like, I got here, I'm stuck with it. So when you, when you flee, you got to drop the sin. But if you have nowhere to go, you're going to pick it back up. So you got to drop it and then you have to chase after, you have to run after righteousness and godliness and faith and love and steadfastness and gentleness. You can't carry that sin with you. And so, you know, I need to uh, get rid of it. That's why he tells them to flee it. And trust me, the backpack has legs of its own. It's going to try and chase you down. That's why we have to continually flee from it and follow. Now, one of the, the cool things about the Bible is that it mixes metaphors all the time, which are no-no in English, but it's the Bible. So we get a totally different metaphor now in verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The word fight is actually the word agonize. It comes out of the Olympic Games that the Greeks had. That this is a, it's something that's serious. So how are you and I going to fight this fight? Well, fight the good fight of the faith. I'm gonna just, kind of go to meddling here a little bit. The sad state of affairs in the United States is that for many non-Christians, the only fight they see Christians fighting is the political fight, not the good fight. You and I are not dedicated to parties or political people or political movements. You and I are dedicated to the kingdom of God and the king who sits enthroned over that kingdom, Jesus Christ. And that's the fight people need to see us fighting. And so he says, make sure that the fight we do is the good fight. Now, I realize that sometimes that involves political issues. I get all that. But the reality is we need to fight the good fight. And what is the good fight of the faith? That we take hold of the eternal life. So what is eternal life? John 17, 1 says, and this is eternal life, that they might know you, the one and only God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Meaning, I have eternal life right now because I belong to Jesus right now. And I will have eternal life forever because I will belong to Jesus forever. So eternal life is not what starts in heaven. It's what starts when you give your life to Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the focus is on the life. We have his life. And because Jesus is eternal and we have his life, then our life, which is his life, is eternal because he is eternal. And so we want to grab hold of that. We don't ever let go of that. The eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That we are to profess that we belong to Jesus Christ. When people see us fleeing stuff and following other stuff, when they see us living a life of righteousness and godliness and all that, and they go, why do you do that? 
You don't say, because that's how I was raised. You say, because Jesus has made a difference in my life. Because Jesus, now, here's the, the nutty thing about Christian confession, Christian profession of our faith. Here's what's so interesting about it. When people hear us talk about Jesus and they start watching us and they see us blow it and blow it, we will. I know, not you, somebody else in here. <sighs> when they see it, and they, this is the, oh, I didn't think Christians did that. Our answer is, you're right, Christians are not supposed to do that. But the message of Christianity is not that we're perfect, it's that we're forgiven. It's not an excuse to go out and do bad stuff, but when you and I don't meet the standard and we get called on it, it's an opportunity to make the greatest profession that we can make. And that is Christianity is not about perfection. Christianity is about forgiveness. Christians, we're, we're not all that great, but we are all that forgiven. He says, that's the profession that you need to make sure that you declare you want to fight the fight. Now, I want you to understand how important this fight is. When you and I think about boxing, which is the kind of fight that they're talking about here, and we think about, we think about gloves, we think about gloves kind of done to protect the person receiving the blows and also the person giving the blows. And so we have gloves that we wear to kind of protect us. Now, we put those to the test. I assume nobody wants me to put these to the test. But if you would like, I'll do so. I'll, I'll pull my punch so they don't break a rib. But where are they? Go, wow, man, it's, yes. Gentleness is not killing somebody when you know how. So, these are their cushion, they're designed. This is actually designed to work out on a heavy bag. So, when they would box in Bible times, they didn't wear these kind of gloves. They were just made out of leather, it was just a piece of leather, but sewn into leather along the knuckles were little pieces of metal. So that when you would make contact with someone, you would actually rip their flesh. As a matter of fact, sometimes boxing contests were fatal. They were a life and death kind of fight. When the Bible says that you and I are supposed to fight the good fight, this is not a fight about cherry pie or apple pie. It's not a fight about Ford or Chevy. By the way, the answers are apple and Ford. <laughs> it's not a fight about your favorite kind of ice cream or that sort of stuff. The, the fight of the good fight is one that is life and death because it is a message about Jesus. And only in Jesus is there life. And apart from Jesus, there's only death. And those that belong to Jesus are going to live with him forever. And those that reject Jesus are going to spend forever in eternal death called the lake of fire and brimstone. That's why this is such an important fight. We are engaged in a battle for the souls of people for all of eternity. And so he says, you know, Timothy, you want to make sure you grab a hold of that eternal life and that you fight the good fight. Then verses 13 through 16, you say, here's where you and I need to keep our focus to make this happen. He says, I charge you in the presence of God. I don't know about you, but that's kind of frightening. Not I charge you in the presence of the witnesses of verse 12, but I charge you in the presence of God. This commitment is in the presence of God who gives life to all things. And of Jesus Christ who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. Now, if you want to read about Jesus' confession, his testimony before Pontius Pilate, this mentioned here in verse 13. You read about it, Mark chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. It is recorded in the other Gospels, but Mark has the, the lengthiest description of it. So Mark 15, 1, 2, if you want to go back and read about uh, Jesus giving his testimony before Pontius Pilate. He made a good confession. He says, Jesus is our role model. Jesus is our example. He is the one. We want to, to be like him to, to make a good confession. So verse 14, what is this charge? To keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. Now, what is the commandment? It's not commandments plural like the Ten Commandments. It's the commandment singular. Probably the commandment here is that your profession and your life run somewhat aligned with each other. Because if not, your profession is what? Stained and reproached. So keep the commandment, both in what you say and what you do, 
that it's unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not about you, but I certainly am glad that someday Jesus is going to come again and fix this mess. I wish it was sooner rather than later. Matter of fact, some days I really wish it was that day. Okay, apparently I don't care. But there are days I would love for him to come. Like I'm like, man, Jesus, this would be a good day. Can I get on the calendar committee? So he said, I want you to, to, to be like, to keep that commandment. Now watch what he does in verse 15, which he will display at the proper time. He'll know when he's coming. And now we get a shift in this book. So uh, every, for a number of years, every couple of years, um, I go to the largest African-American preaching conference in the United States. And I like going to pastor's conference and this one's, it, it has all the stuff I like in it. But one year they had a panel of guys, preachers, and they were talking about their sermons and one of the guys made this, he was a guest there. One of the guys made this comment, he said, you know, he's a white guy. I like to end the service with a quiet, reflective thought for people to take with them. Now, two things went through my mind. Number one, dude, this ain't the right place for that statement. And number two, that's not biblical. The Bible never ends with a fizzle. It always ends with a bang. Jesus doesn't die. He dies and rises again. Jesus doesn't go to heaven. He goes to heaven because he's coming back again. The Bible ends not with amen, but amen and amen because it's that good. I mean, you look at the prophets, they end with a note of rejoicing. So here's what happens. The apostle Paul has gone through all this information now with Timothy. And he gets to a point, he says, look, I'm going to stop trying to to give you all this information and everything. He's a man, I just want to celebrate the goodness of Jesus right here. And so look what he does, starting in the, the middle of verse 15. He's not laying out some long theological treatise, that'd be Romans. Instead, what he says, he who is the blessed and only sovereign. Blessed means we recognize who he is. He blesses us when he bends down to us. He is blessed and the only sovereign. There are lots of kings, there are lots of leaders, there are lots of rulers, but I'm telling you, there is only one sovereign. There's only one who has ever been in charge, who is in charge whoever be in charge and he does not sit in Washington DC he sits enthroned above the circles of the earth forever and ever and ever he is the only sovereign but he's not done and Paul, Paul just started getting wound up right here the organs playing behind him. I can just see it all in my head now he is the king of kings and lord of lords now what in the world is king of kings and lord of lords what is that well in the old testament there was no way to say most or best so if you want to say the holiest place, you would call it the holy of holies. So if you want to say the kingest, you say king of kings. If you want to say lordest, you say lord of lords. So guys, you need to look at your wife and you need to say wife of wives. You're telling her she's the wifest of them all. If today you want to say to me, pastor of pastors, it's all right. <laughs> So that, so when he says king of kings, what he's saying is, sure, there are plenty of people who claim to be kings, but I'll tell you who the kingest is, and that is Jesus. There are plenty of people who say to be their Lord, but I'll tell you who the Lordest is, that is Jesus. He is the kingest and the Lordest and the only sovereign of all. But he doesn't quit there. Look what he says in verse 16. Who alone has immortality. Now you and I will live forever, but we have a starting point. So our eternity only goes one way, but Jesus is immortal because his eternity goes to the future, but also goes to the past because he has no beginning and no end. He alone is immortal forever and ever and ever in both directions. He alone has immortality and his brilliance and his glory and his majesty are so great that he dwells in unapproachable light that no one has ever seen or can see. We will never be able to fully comprehend the glory of an infinite God. Because we are finite and he is infinite and his glory is unending. And so he dwells in inapproachable light. And he says, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. I mean, he amens himself. He's not sitting here trying to give Timothy all kinds of information for a class. He says, man, I'm telling you, Timothy, if you're going to fight the good fight, if you're going to flee sin, if you're going to follow after righteousness and godliness and all that, if you're going to do that, you've got to keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ, who is worthy of all praise and all glory and all honor and all blessing and all worship. And it's high time that Christians quit telling people, don't do that. And start telling them, you need to stand up and celebrate the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who is the only sovereign. <laughs> Jesus is worthy of excitement, not a quiet, reflective thought. Because he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let me show you how this works. If you go to a performance of children, 
You don't go to watch the kids. You go to watch a kid. Your child or your grandchild or your sister child or whoever it is. And when someone says, why are you here? They're not expecting you to say, well, I'm here for the Peter Pan performance. (laughs) Then you say, I'm here for, see the little girl on the second row? That that one, you don't ever say the little girl in the pink tutu, all of them. But that little girl, the other one there, or the tree. You see the tree? That, that's my grandson. <laughs> you say, that, I'm here for that one. Like, you kind of see everything else going on, but the reality is your focus is on the person you're there to see, the one you're there for. There's lots of stuff in our world that we see, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But our focus is on the one we're here for, and that's Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul says, Timothy, you need to flee some stuff. You need to follow some stuff. You need to fight the good fight. It's a life and death fight. But the only way we're going to pull that off is if we realize the one we're here for. And he's the one we're focused on. He's the one we're celebrating. Yep, there's lots of stuff to see. And there are lots of people claiming lots of stuff. But our focus is on the one we're here for. Who's the one you're here for? I know the one I'm here for. His name is Jesus. And he is the only sovereign He is immortal, clothed in light that you and I will never comprehend because he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's where our focus needs to be. But I want to go back to the beginning of the passage, verse 11. Because he says, you, O man of God. The reality is you can't do any of this unless first you belong to God. And there's only one way that you can belong to God. And that is by recognizing you've broken his law, you stand guilty, and you put your faith in the only one who can forgive you. And that's Jesus Christ who died and rose again. That's what makes us a person of God. That's what makes us someone who belongs to him. And when we belong to him, then there's some some stuff we need to toss behind and we need to leave and we need to flee. There's some stuff we need to pursue. We need to follow after it. There's a fight that we're involved in, but we want to fight the good fight, proclaiming the good name of Jesus Christ. And you know what? It's a great life because we're doing it for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who dwells in unapproachable light that you and I will never comprehend. He is that infinitely awesome. Our Heavenly Father, I I really wish we could flee one day and be done for good with sin, but we know that's not the case. That's something we have to do regularly. And so I, I pray that you would help us to daily abandon that sin in our lives. I pray that you would help us to pursue after righteousness and godliness that we would pursue faith and love, that we would pursue steadfastness and gentleness. And God, I pray that our profession would be faithful and consistent. And God, when we do fail, and when we get called on it, to use that as an opportunity to share the greatest news that there's ever been, that we don't get to heaven because we've done it right. We get to heaven because we belong to Jesus. And he's the one who did it right for us. So I pray that you would help us to rejoice in our Jesus and how great and wonderful and awesome he is. Then help us to live a life that brings honor and glory to him. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.